are continuing in chapter one today. James uh, has been stacking truth upon truth upon truth upon truth and this kind of make this beautiful theological and yet practical statements about what it means to live out our faith, our genuine faith in the midst of the trials that we will find ourselves going through. That, that's the first thing, of course, that he talked about was the fact that it's not a matter of, uh, of if, but a matter of when you and I will go through trials. We're going to go through those. And James then encourages our hearts to recognize where do we go? Where do we turn? To whom do we turn in the midst of those trials? He says that we seek wisdom from the Lord. We seek that wisdom from the Lord that the Lord will give to us graciously, generously, without reproach. And then James warns us that in the midst of the temptations, or in the midst of trials, we're going to go through temptations. And the temptations um, we have to be very aware of because it's in those moments where we're facing difficulties, facing trials, that Satan will kind of dangle out temptation in front of us to, to grow bitter, to grow angry, to, to doubt and begin to act in a way that's disobedient towards what we know God has called us to do and how to live. And so he, he walks us through uh, what temptation is all about and how that leads to sin and what do we do in that moment. We're seeking wisdom, he says, by seeking wisdom through the work of the Holy Spirit by the receiving of God's word. That last week of, of beginning to prepare our hearts for God's word. He says, um, as we studied last week, that we do that by being quick to hear, being quick to hear in context, specifically to the Word of God, that we want to go to the Word of God, our hearts prepare to hear what God's Word has to say. Quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. So we're not desiring to go with an idea that we'll get endorsed disobedience from God's Word so that we can then do whatever we want. He said, no, you go and you hear from the Word, and even if the Word tells you as God through his word is teaching you something you don't want to be taught because it's painful, because it hurts, because it brings conviction to your life. You're not quick to argue back and not quick to grow angry with the Lord because of what the Lord's teaching you. You are in humility, ready to receive the word of God. And so that brings us now to this issue of the continued receiving of the word of God and what that looks like. And so as we look at that today, he's got some great, again, practical and theological understanding for us. If you look in verse 21 of James chapter 1, he says, therefore put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and once forgets what he is like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and preserves, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. And if anyone thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows with their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. So there's a lot a lot to unpack there, a lot to work through. Um, but as we look at this, James is, is readying our hearts to hear God's word. He says, you gotta be prepared. You gotta be prepared to, to hear, to not argue, to not grow angry. And in part of the way that we do that, again, he's just stacking truth upon truth, is he says, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness, or literally the overflow of wickedness that exists within your heart. Put that away that you might be ready to receive God's word. So he wants us to receive the word of God with a clean heart. This, this terminology is really fascinating. First of all, putting away. That idea of putting away gives the idea, and, and the imagery in the Greek is used here, of taking off dirty clothes and putting on fresh new clothes. So the idea of the imagery that James is getting at, certainly in agrarian culture and society, would be after you've worked the day, long and hard out in the fields and the dirty roads and maybe the mud and all of that, you come home and you've got filth and grime and all that on you. You are ready to take off those dirty clothes and put on something new. And that's the idea. You are putting away, putting aside, taking off that filthiness. That's what he's talking about. The idea of then replacing that with something else. Now we know that as Christians, the Bible teaches us that we are saved not by our works, but we're saved by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We are saved not because of what we do, but because of what God has done for us and on our behalf. So we come to faith in Jesus Christ. We, we trust that he has redeemed us by his blood, 
His death, his burial, his resurrection gives us the hope of salvation. But we also know that even after we have trusted in Christ, because we are living with sinful natures, we're going to continue to face temptation. And sometimes that temptation is going to lead to sin, and we're going to sin against God. And frankly, sometimes in our lives, we have unconfessed sin that we're dealing with. We have sin that we're carrying from day to day that whether we're afraid to deal with it, we're afraid to take that before the Lord, or we're ashamed to deal with that, or we just want to ignore it, we do not deal with it. And it becomes as these filthy rags upon our soul that doesn't allow us to receive the word of God the way that God intends. So he says we are removing all of that, putting aside all of that, and then the word for filthiness, that's a really interesting word. It's the Greek word ruporia, and it carries within it this idea of the filth and the grime that you get on your body and working hard and all that, but there's actually a pun on words in the Greek here. There's a pun that James uses that has to do with earwax. It's kind of gross, but that's what he's saying. He's saying that you literally have this earwax that builds up in your ears that doesn't allow you to hear the word of God spiritually the way that you should. And here's why James uses that. And I think, it's, I think it's brilliant. Because here's what we do. Sometimes as Christians, when we come to faith in Jesus Christ, we ask God to forgive us of our sins, and, and we go, okay, I'm a Christian now. I'm a follower of Jesus. We begin to categorize sins. And I think we do that just in general as human beings. People say, well, murder is so much worse than telling a white lie or whatever the case may be. I, I can cheat on this test, but if, I certainly wouldn't you know, cheat on my spouse or something like that. People categorize their sins in a very dangerous way. And that's just the reality of what we do. And sometimes we do that because it makes us feel better about our sin. It makes us uh, you know, able to say, well, that person did that. I haven't done that. I feel a little bit better. And James is warning us against that because what James is saying in this word, the, the idea of filthiness, the idea of the earwax being built up, is it's not just the big ticket sins that we go, oh, I'm going to avoid that because that's a big deal. He's saying, no, it's all sin, all filthiness, literally is what he's getting at. That means the big stuff and what we regard as the small stuff. And in fact, what James is saying is, look, you might think you can ignore all the big stuff, but oftentimes it's the little sin that you disregard that builds up and then doesn't allow you to receive the word of God the way that God intends because your hearts are not pure. The stuff that you ignore and act like it's not a big deal, you sweep it under the rug, it's not a big deal, it's just a little white lie, it's just a little cheating here, it's just a little this or that, it's a little bit of lust, just a little bit of greed, it's the stuff that sometimes we go, hey, I can deal with that. The reality is James is saying, no, you can't deal with that. It's the big and the little sins, it's all sin. And it all corrupts our heart, it all corrupts our soul, and in the imagery that James is using is that that builds up and does not allow us to receive God's word the way that God desires for us to receive it. It's very practical what he's getting at. It's very simple, isn't it? But yet we struggle with that. Sin hinders our receiving of the word of God the way that God intends. If you and I have unconfessed sin in our lives, and we haven't gone before the Lord in that, and we haven't asked God to forgive us of that, and we're not dealing with that, and by the way, that's, that's pretty much a daily thing. Right? We face temptation every day, we sin every day, right, in our thought life and even in some of the things that we say and those small ticket sins that we deal with, those build up. We need to confess those and seek the forgiveness of God that we might receive the word of God and be ready to live for him and to honor him. Otherwise, we are, as he's going to say in a moment, deceiving ourselves. So just think about that for a moment. That's really important for us to recognize that sin can hinder what it is that God desires to do in our lives when we have that sin built up and we have not confessed it and we have not given that over to the Lord and we act like it's not a big deal, it is hindering your walk with Christ in a very profound way, no matter how much you try to ignore that. So we have to be ready for that. We have to be willing to understand that. We have to allow God to clean out our soul, so to speak. But, but the reality is, we sometimes want to you know, clean up our spiritual lives the way that a teenager cleans up their room, right? We tell our kids, go clean up your room. Go clean up your room. We got all the clothes off the floor and get all the trash that's laying around picked up and throw that in the trash and all the clutter and all that stuff. And, and maybe an hour later, you go up to check and see if your kid has cleaned their room and you walk in and there's no clothes on the floor. It looks really good and, and there's no trash and clutter, but you know to not look in the closet. You know to not look under the bed. Because chances are that stuff got shoved somewhere. That clutter got shoved somewhere. They didn't really deal with it in the way that you asked them to. Right? And that's the way that sometimes we clean out our lives spiritually. Jesus, I love you. 
I want to serve you. I want you to come and invade my soul. I want you to take over my soul, God. I want you to come into the living room of my soul. You're welcome there, God, but don't go into my bedroom because if you look in that closet, it's bad. If you look under the bed, I've got some stuff hidden there. I got under the bed, I've got some bitterness that I have not dealt with yet. In the closet, I've got some unforgiveness, God, that I haven't dealt with yet. That closet over there, that's my thought life with with some lust and some greed and some evil stuff that I I just haven't quite been ready to give over to you, God. So I I want you to come right here and, and, and be welcome here, but not in these other parts. And that's what we do sometimes as Christians. And James is saying, no, you you can't do that and expect to hear from God the way that you desire and the way that God desires to speak to you. You, You've got to allow God to deal with your sin, to deal with your wickedness. That's why he says all filthiness, right, all of it, the big and the little, and the rampant with literally the overflow of wickedness, meaning the stuff that you don't like to think about, the stuff that you like to ignore, that wickedness that exists, you deal with all of that by giving that over to God. And maybe you haven't done that this morning because you're ashamed and you're afraid that if you go before the Lord, there's, there's nothing but shame and, and guilt and God is, is going to deal with you in an unkind way. Or, or maybe you're just prideful. Maybe you're just prideful and you're like, hey, I, I, don't, I can handle it on my own. I don't really need to go to God with that. And the reality is there is unconfessed sin in that way. Maybe, maybe you're afraid God is going to be angry towards you. Listen, the blood of Jesus Christ has covered your sin. The wrath of God was poured out not on you, but upon the Son when he hung upon the cross for you and me and our sins. So we can go to the Father. We can go because of Jesus and confess our sin and know that he will cleanse us of that, 1 John 1, 9 says. Restore us unto righteousness. I mean, that's an incredible thing. We walk in the righteousness of God, yet we be sinful. There's where our need to confess our sin is. And so this morning, he says, you, you, you deal with that. You prepare your hearts to receive the word of God by putting all that overflow of wickedness, all that filthiness out of your soul. Confess that before the Lord and be ready. And, and I'll just be really frank with you. I've, in 26 years of ministry, I, I hear this a lot. People say, well, I, I read the Bible, I don't really get a lot out of the Bible. Well, I know the Bible sometimes can be hard to understand, right? I know the Bible sometimes when we're trying to read it, and this is why it's important to read it contextually and and historically and, and, um, and, and look at it from those angles. But I know it can be tough. But you know what? We have so many helps now available today. You can download free commentaries online. You can Google stuff and uh, do word searches and all that. So, so here's what I really think is happening. When people say, I, I read the Bible and get a lot out of it, I, I think it's important for us to just be honest enough to ask the question then, are we reading the Bible and not getting a lot out of it because there's some unconfessed sin in our lives that are keeping us from hearing the word of God, the way that God intends. Because James says that's a factor. And it's a factor we may not like to deal with. It's a factor we may be ashamed of. It's a factor that we may not want to give ear to. But James says, listen, you've got to confess that before the Lord. And I'm just saying today, if you are reading the word and not getting a lot out of it, maybe today, honestly, within your heart of hearts, you would say, is there some unconfessed sin, some overflow of wickedness that I gotta let God deal with. There's some unforgiveness, there's some bitterness, there's some lust, there's some greed, there's some envy, there's some jealousy. Whatever it is, I I gotta give that, and I I just haven't, I haven't given that to the Lord. No wonder God's not speaking to me the way that I I would want God to speak. And so, we we receive the word of God with a clean and pure heart. But I I love that James does this, and, and so many this is the beauty of theology and, and practical application. So many of, of the writers, especially of the New Testament, we see this all throughout the Old Testament as well. When we're called to take away something, there's always a call to replace it with something else. And so James says here that you're putting away all filthiness, you're putting away all rampant wickedness, or the overflow of wickedness, and then what are we replacing with? We're receiving with meekness the implanted word which is able to save our souls. So we're throwing off the filthiness, we're throwing off the sin and we're replacing that with meekness, with humility. Literally a teachable spirit, James says. That we're to go to the word of God and part of our preparation to receive the word of God is confessing our sin, throwing off that sin and replacing it with a teachable spirit so that when God speaks to us, we are quick to hear, right? Slow to speak and slow to anger because we're ready to receive it. I know that you might find this hard to believe, but there are a lot of Christians who don't have teachable spirits, right? We, we sometimes think that once we trust in Christ and we get some knowledge about us, about 
the Bible and about Christianity, all of a sudden we're, we're like God's gift to the world, right? We are, we're, God should be honored that we're on his side, right? We know our Bible. We can argue theology. We can argue points of this and points of that and framework and all that. And, and, and the reality is that's not what God desires. God desires that we come before him and others with a teachable spirit, that we recognize that we don't know it all, and that's why we need to go to the Word and be dependent upon the Holy Spirit as He teaches us, as He leads us. I met so many guys in seminary, man, guys in seminary. Man, they could read Greek, and they could read Hebrew, and they were God's gift to the church, and I thought, man, you are gonna, you are gonna fall, you are gonna burn in the pastorate because you have all this knowledge, but you think you are God's gift to the ministry, and once you get dealing with brokenness and heartache and sorrow and sin, it's a whole different ballgame, isn't it? And so we are, we are called by God here to have a, a teachable spirit as we specifically go to the word of God. But that's a good application for all of us at any moment to have a teachable spirit. So he says we receive the word of God with not only a clean heart, but then with humility. Going before the Lord, God, I, I need you to teach me. God, I, I, want, to, I want to learn. I want to grow. I, I don't want to just read this for the sake of reading it. I want to receive it with a teachable spirit, God, that I would be open to doing that which you've called me to do. Even if it scares me, even if it's a, uh, it makes me a little nervous, gets me out of my comfort zone, God, I, I want to do that. So he says, you go with humility. And then he says, we're called to obey the word of God. Right? Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. So here James um, really states what should be the simple command, that we're doers of the word, right? That we actually put it into practice, we're obedient. And this really begins to drive home the theme that James will deal with the rest of the entire book, that James is not so concerned with what you say you believe, but how your belief affects your behavior. That's what James is concerned about. All right, Christian, don't tell me what you believe. Tell me and show me how your belief shows itself in your behavior, how your genuine faith is expressed in your life. See, James is not making a dichotomy against uh, works versus grace. He's saying that because of grace, because of salvation that has been brought to you, that ought to affect your behavior for the glory of God. So what you say you believe should affect your behavior. If not, you're deceiving yourself, he says. And what a terrible thing to be deceived, right? We hate to be deceived. We're worried about being deceived. We're always worried about scams and this and that and all that. And it's a terrible feeling to have someone take advantage of you and scam you and deceive you. But James says, worse would be that you would deceive yourself with your spiritual life. And we go, well, I, don't, I don't want to do that. I don't want to deceive myself spiritually. How do I know? What's the litmus test? Well, he's going to give us that. And the reality, he says, number one, is that you then are putting what you hear into practice. This is about obedience unto the Lord. Not because you have to, to earn salvation, but because you want to, because you've already understood salvation. And he says here that the, the word, that we are to be hearers only. Now, this word in the Greek literally means the word auditor. And that's really fascinating because maybe some of you in college, you audited a class in college, or maybe you were in classes when you had people auditing and, and you would be all stressed out about, you know, taking notes because you had a paper to write and you had a test to take and all that. And you'd look over and there'd be somebody and they were the most like laid back, sipping their latte, not a care in the world person. And you go, what is their deal? Well, they probably were auditing the class, right? They didn't have to worry about the test. They didn't have to worry about writing the papers. They didn't have to worry about any of that. They could come in and just get knowledge and not have to really apply it. That's the idea of auditing. And James says some of us, we are just auditing the faith, right? We're, we're, we're auditing the word. We're just hearing the word, but God desires we put it into practice. I remember um, when we were in college, it was probably back in 1994, we met, um, my wife Sarah was, she had three roommates. They lived in an apartment. And one of her roommates got a new boyfriend. And so they said, well, we'd like to get everybody together and come meet her new boyfriend. And so we're going to have dinner and everybody's going to meet the new boyfriend and all that and the really good friends and everything. And so, yeah, so I went over there that night and we meet her new boyfriend. It's 1994. Dude's probably born about 40 years too late because he would have really excelled growing up in the 1960s. That kind of guy, that kind of thing, you know. And, uh, and so... Um, so we were just talking, right? We were just having a conversation. Everybody's talking about school and our classes and our, what we're doing. And so I looked at him and I said, hey man, what, do you go to, what are you going to school for? Meaning, right, if I ask you that, you're like, well, this is what I'm majoring in or whatever. I said, what are you going to school for? And he looks at me with, with, the, with such disdain on his face. Like I was the dumbest person on the planet. And he goes, knowledge, bruh. <laughs> knowledge. You remember that, babe? 
Oh my gosh. <laughs> knowledge, bro. Like, okay. What are you going to do with that knowledge? Right? That's what I was asking. Are you, you know, you're going to be a doctor. You're going to go into physical therapy. I mean, what are you doing, man? And that's the way we treat the Christian life sometimes. We are oddity. We, we go out from church. And, oh, it's a great message. That was a great worship service. I love my class. That was a great day. But we don't put any of it into practice. It doesn't affect our lives on Monday. James says that's what it's like when you're just auditing, when you're just hearing and you're not being a doer, you're not putting it into obedience in your life. It has no effect on you. He says, then you are deceiving yourselves. He's saying you, you, you don't have genuine faith when you can so easily hear and audit the word and not have any desire to be compelled to be obedient to what you're hearing from God. Because a child of God wants to please his father. And so he says, for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. So James, not only does he give us the instruction, then he illustrates it himself. And preachers love this because we don't have to come up with an illustration, right? So James gives us an illustration to look at. Literally, he says, well, I've, got, I've got the idea of the mirror. If you are a person who is a hearer of the word only and not a doer of the word, you're like a person that goes and looks in the mirror, sees your reflection, walks away then and forgets what you look like forgets what you have seen. What a beautiful, powerful illustration that James uses there. All of us this morning probably used a mirror, right? And if, if you're like me, that's the least, most exciting point of your day, right? Because you look at yourself in the mirror and you're like, oh man, I need help, right? Where's the comb? This is, I forgot this is what my face looks like. I was hoping it'd look a little bit different today, right? And, and the reality is we, we, we understand what that's like. We understand because the mirror serves two purposes. The mirror serves two purposes. It's to examine and then it's restoration. As we look in the mirror, we go, man, I need some help, right? I got to comb that hair. I got to put some makeup on. I got to look nice. I, gotta, I need the mirror to help me see how to do that. And he says, this is what the mirror of God does spiritually for us. You look into the mirror of God spiritually and what you see is you see your sin. You see your envy and your jealousy you see your bitterness, you see your unforgiveness, you see your lust, you see your greed, but you also see to whom to turn in the midst of that. You see that there is hope for forgiveness of that in Jesus Christ. Amen. And so you see the sin of your life that needs to be dealt with, and James says, but if you are a man who is only a hearer of the word and not a doer, you see that wickedness and you do nothing about it. You do not turn to Christ. You do not seek forgiveness. You do not seek the power of the Holy Spirit to overcome and confess that sin that is running rampant of wickedness in your soul. You walk away and you forget it's there to your detriment. That's what he's saying. He said, you deceive yourselves. So let us not be, he says, as a man who looks in a mirror intently at his natural face. By the way, natural face, of that word literally means Genesis face, like, the, like, like this is who you are. All right, so you look in the mirror and you see your sinful nature. You see, who, you, can, you can dress it up all you want. You can justify it all you want. You can say, this is just who we are as human beings. This is just the culture around me. No, you are a sinner. We are sinners and we need forgiveness. And he says, that's what the mirror shows us. And it shows us the glorious gospel and grace of Jesus that he was able to do that, but you walk away not doing anything. But, verse 25, the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and preserves, being no here who forgets but a doer who acts, he will be blessed by doing. What is the perfect law? What is the law of liberty? He's not talking about the Old Testament law, because the whole purpose of the Old Testament law was to show us our imperfection, right? to show us the perfect standard of God's righteousness that we cannot uphold, the whole reason we need a savior. And so he says, instead now, we have this perfect law, this law of liberty. He's talking about the work of Jesus Christ on the cross that has fulfilled the Old Testament law so that you and I don't have to do it. You and I cannot live up to the Old Testament law. You and I break the Old Testament law every day. In some form or fashion, you and I break it. But praise God, the Bible says here that God has overcome that. He now brings the law of liberty, which has fulfilled that law for you and for me, and we 
are blessed as we get to do obedience, not because we have to, but because we get to. See, it changes our whole motivation. I hope you get that this morning. I hope you get this morning. You and I are not called to do because we have to. We're called to do because we get to. The whole motivation changes by grace that you and I look to Jesus. All right, we look in that spiritual mirror and we see our wickedness and our sin and we know that we can't handle it. We can't deal with it on our own, but praise God that he has done that for us. He has offered us salvation and forgiveness and empowered us by the Holy Spirit that we can overcome because of him. And so then we say, man, I, I want to live for Jesus. I want to be obedient. I want to put it into practice. Not because I have to, but because I get to. Because God has loved me and saved me, and I want to live for him. I want to honor him. Amen. Everything changes in motivation. And he says, you'll be blessed in doing. So he gives us this instruction and this illustration, and then he gives us application. I'm going to move really quickly just through these three and he's gonna really talk about these in some greater detail moving forward. So I just wanna mention them here. He says that, that being a doer of the word, expressing the genuine faith that you have is, is lived out in three really big categories that sometimes we don't often think about. That, that the genuine faith of a believer who is putting into practice the word of God is going to be seen even in the way that it affects our speech. It's interesting that he starts here with this in verse 26. If anyone thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Uh, Jesus talked about the fact that, that whatever resides within our soul ends up coming outward, ends up coming in the way that we speak and the way that we behave. And here James is simply stating that another way, that if we say we have genuine faith in the Lord Jesus and we're wanting to be doers of the word, that's going to begin to show itself and express itself even in the way that we talk to one another. Now, granted, we are not perfect individuals, and sometimes we say things that are hurtful to one another, and we, 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 uh, we have things and words slip out that we wish wouldn't slip out and all those kind of things. Like, everybody's gone through all that kind of stuff, right? We can understand that today, but he's saying the motivation of our hearts live and express in genuine faith is that we say, Lord, I want the words that come from my mouth to give you praise. I want the words that come from my mouth to bring you glory. I want the words that come from my mouth to point people to you. I, I want my life to be so affected by what I receive from the word that even in my words, I honor you. I'm obedient unto you. I live unto you. He says, otherwise, your religion is worthless. And really, that's what religion is, isn't it? Religion is worthless. Religion cannot save us. But genuine faith and a personal relationship with Jesus Christ is what brings hope and salvation and forgiveness. And it ought to then affect every fiber of our being, even down to what we say to one another. So that the words that come out of our mouth, the jokes that we tell, uh, the way we speak to people, the way we speak to our friends, way, the way we speak to the person at the restaurant when we go out to eat who is waiting on us, the way that we speak to anyone and everyone around us should be affected by this desire to be doers of the word. And so then he says, Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is to visit orphans and widows in their affliction. So he says not only does genuine faith affect even our speech, the way we speak to one another, and again, he's gonna, we're going to do a whole sermon on that. He's going to talk about that in great detail. But he says it also affects our service towards one another, our attitude towards one another, how we care for one another. And in context here, remember James is writing to the Jerusalem church. He's writing to the church that's dispersed throughout uh, the Roman uh, Greek world. And in that culture, in that day, the orphans and the widows were the most vulnerable of that society. Why were they the most vulnerable? Because in that culture, if a woman were to marry a man and then that man die or that man, for whatever reason, leave her, she's left on her own until maybe perhaps she can find another husband. Women of that culture were not able to go out and, and get a high paying job where she could take care of the family. They were then dependent on the care of others around them and the church of the Lord Jesus Christ were the ones that stepped up and often cared for the orphans and the widows. They became the family of those widows and those orphans who have been abandoned by families. And this is what James is talking about, that, that our genuine faith of being a doer of the word that we have received impacts the care that we have for other people. It impacts the way we treat one another. It impacts the way that we show a servant heart towards one another. I want to just look at somebody in a, in a, in a, 
point of desperation and, and, and hopelessness and leave them there. He says, no, in, in fact, then you have a servant's heart that desires to put them before yourself. So he says that our genuine faith, as we are doers of the word, is that we take care of the most vulnerable in their affliction, that we make sure that we have a servant's heart towards one another. That has not changed in 2,000 years. We should be a people, as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, that care for one another, those that are sitting next to you, and then also care for those that maybe you have no relationship with, but you see them in their affliction, you see them in their pain, you see them in their brokenness, and you don't just leave them in that place and say, God bless you. No, you have a heart to care for them. Because theology is practical. And then he says, finally, that this genuine faith even affects oneself unstained from the world. Now, the world, he means, he doesn't mean the cosmos, he doesn't mean the universe, he doesn't mean the earth. He's talking about the, the, the worldview of the world, right? The, the way that people value things, how they value things, what they value, their, their outlook on morality, their outlook on all of these things. He says, the Christian, the child of God, right, is to be set apart, is to be holy, is to be blameless, is to be different. So that those who do not know Jesus Christ, when they see your behavior, which is built upon or an expression of what you say you believe, then that ought to do something to them. They ought to go, man, there's something different about that person. Right? They're different than I am. They, they, they're different than what they believe and why they believe and how they act. And, and their behavior is set up by a different belief system than I have. And, and it, it, it's about this reality of being a people of God who belong to a kingdom that is not of this world. And so he says, genuine faith, a person that's a doer and not a hearer only, it affects every part of your life. And again, he's not arguing for perfection here, but he's arguing for a people who have a heart that when we fall down, that when we fail, we confess that before the Lord who is able and just to set us back where we need to be we, with a teachable spirit, go before the Lord and say, Lord, I want to live for you. Not because I have to, but because you have done so much for me that I am so undeserving of God. I want to give you every moment of every day, even in the words that I say, God, I want to honor you. That's what James is getting at. And I don't know where all of us are at this morning spiritually, but I would just say this. Here's a good place for us to close, right? Maybe today, if you are one of those individuals who would say, when I read the Bible, I, don't, I just don't get a lot out of it lately. I don't feel like God's speaking to me. I don't feel like God is hearing me. I don't feel like I'm getting anything. Can I, can I just ask you today that you would be humble enough before the Lord, that you would be honest enough with yourself, that maybe you would say, Lord, look, there's some unconfessed sin I need to deal with. I mean, I'm just, I know I've been holding on to this unforgiveness for a while. I know I've been holding on to this bitterness for a while. I know I've been holding on to this greed or whatever it is. And you say, Lord, I want to give that over to you right now because I, I want to receive your word with gladness. And, and I don't want to just be a, a hearer only. I want to be a doer of the word. I want to put into practice in my life. I want my behavior to be an expression of what I say I believe. And Lord, I believe in you. So I want the way that I treat people the closest friend and the perfect stranger, I want that to honor you. I want the way that I speak to people and the words that come out of my mouth to point people to you, not point people away from you. God, I, I want to live in a way that is different so that people see the difference you make in my life. If you come before the Lord with a teachable spirit, with humility today, God will begin to do that within your heart. And this week, I promise you that as you have made those preparations to receive the word of God, you'll receive the word of God in a very different way this week than you have before. So maybe today as we pray and as we sing and close out our service through song, that's where you are and you just need to pray and give that over to the Lord. Maybe there's a decision you need to make. We'll have some of us sitting up here at the front. You can just come tap us on the shoulder. We'd love to pray with you about whatever that is. But you, you respond today to what God may be saying to your heart. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the book of James, which is so powerfully theological and practical at the same time. God, is so obvious to us that we should be people who put into practice what we say we believe. 
It should be so obvious to us that we are not hearers only, but that we're doers of the word, that we're not simply auditing for knowledge's sake, but that that knowledge should lead to somewhere. That knowledge should make us to be more like you. That that's the, that's the litmus test, oh God, that, that the knowledge that we receive doesn't make us more like you, Jesus. Help that to be our heart's cry today. God, I pray that you'd move in this place this morning. I pray that you would allow us to respond to you, surrendering our hearts to you in a teachable spirit, God. We ask all this in Jesus' name.